Before the break, we played you some of those compelling sound bites from the bar confirmation hearing, and a lot of it had the president's pick for attorney general directly contradicting his soon-to-be future boss, assuming he's confirmed. Now, here are just a few of the examples. Barr saying Jeff Sessions was correct to recuse himself from the Mueller probe. Barr also says it is not a witch hunt, and Mueller should be allowed to proceed until the job is done. Barr also saying Mueller is honorable. Well, joining us now for more on Barr and new developments in the Mueller probe, former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi. He worked under Barr in the Justice Department. Um, given that you know the man, um, and given the long relationship between Barr and Mueller, what surprised you more, that 19-page letter that he wrote a couple of years back, or the testimony that he gave today which seemed to contradict President Trump on so many turns. Well, Richard, the epiphany, Three Kings Day, occurred about a week ago, and it was repeated today. Uh, nominee Barr obviously had an epiphany. Here's how I know him. From 1989 to 1993, I worked in the Department of Justice Tax Division. He was head of the OLC, Legal Counsel's Office. He was Deputy Attorney General, of course, Attorney General. He had a tremendous reputation. He's brilliant. He's capable. He had one flaw in his record during that time. He made the outrageous recommendation to pardon six people involved in Iran-Contra, including Casper Weinberger, on Christmas Eve 1992, mainly because the special counsel, Lawrence Walsh, was starting to focus on George Bush's statements and positions, which were contrary to documentary evidence. Let's now fast forward to today and the epiphany. I think what happened is, no pun intended, he probably got a memo that said, you can't take these positions. The June 2018 memo that he wrote the 19-page sua sponte, unsolicited memo he wrote to Rod Rosenstein has a lot of flaws in it. One huge flaw is this. Under 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2, the famous otherwise clause, he is wrong. Robert Mueller can look at conduct that allegedly Donald Trump engaged in to investigate obstruction of justice. So that memo is wrong, period. The other reason it's wrong is the firing of Jim Comey by itself may not be grounds for obstruction of justice. However, the firing of Comey, which is a constitutional prerogative of the president, may be an overt act as part of an overall scheme to obstruct justice, which may be apparent here. And I got to tell you this, Richard, the opening of an investigation by the FBI into the president's actions, which came out into the light uh, this past weekend, that is a big deal. I worked for the Justice Department for 27 years. To open an investigation against a politician even a lowly congressman with no seniority, let alone the president, requires so many hurdles, it would make a, a, a hurdle in a track meet exhausted the number of hurdles you have to go over. So that is a huge deal that they opened that investigation, which tells me they had significant evidence that pointed towards possible obstruction. Let me pivot to the other big headline, obviously, and that is that the president um, wanted and uh, took actions to keep his conversations with Putin quiet to the point where he took away the notes here from the interpreter and he told the interpreter, don't you say a word about this to anybody, even my own cabinet or even in my own officials. My question is, I understand the compelling argument from a practical level to subpoena interpreters, you want presidents to be able to feel that they can have off the record conversations with world leaders, it could be a chilling effect. However. If this is the only person privity to potential criminal action, what do you think? Have we crossed this line here where this interpreter should be subpoenaed or not? Absolutely. And here's why, Richard. When you're trying to go after evidence regarding the President of the United States, 
the first question a court is going to ask, have you exhausted all of turn alternative means to get that information? It's like when you serve a subpoena on a member of the media. You have to go to that judge and justify why you have a grand jury subpoena, why you have a wiretap. You have to say, we tried everything, Your Honor, and we couldn't find a way to get the same information. If that interpreter is the sole basis of information that they need to shed light on possible issues in their investigation, they should issue a subpoena yesterday. And I would do it if I were in the uh, Mueller office. We're now hearing Devin Nunes. Uh, he used to chair the Intelligence uh, Committee until even Republicans removed him when it was seen that he was literally ferrying over information to the president, um, even though he wouldn't even green light it for Democrats to see on his own committee. Now, apparently, there was this breakfast um, that held, took place in January of 17 before the president even took office that the Mueller team is looking into. It could be foreign funds going into this inauguration, of, uh, you know, basically fund here, and we don't even know even where all the money went. Could a congressman now potentially be in trouble? Absolutely. And <laughs> I worked in the Eastern District of Virginia. We, we indicted and tried Congressman William Jefferson. Congressmen, members of Congress, Senator of the House, absolutely can be indicted or charged and tried. Here's the difficulty that Mr. Nunes has. He has established a reputation as essentially a lapdog and a sycophant for the president of the United States, who, I read an article just now, Trump said he should get the Medal of Honor. That's how good Devin Nunes is. Of course, he really meant the Medal of Freedom. But, but what happened, according to the articles that came out today or yesterday, is that Mr. Nunes and Mr. Flynn, days before the inauguration, are having meetings at Trump Hotel with Turkish officials and other diplomats who may have illegally, allegedly, funneled money into the inauguration. That is a big deal when foreign money is poisoning the political process. That is something that any Justice Department or any member of the Justice Department should move with alacrity on. Let me come back full circle uh, to the guy that uh, you once worked under or worked with over at the Department of Justice. Either you take two sides. One, that the 19-page um, um, letter that he wrote that seemed to say to the president here, you know, basically the whole uh, investigation uh, is wrong on its face here and that you with presidential power supersede all, or today where he said, never mind. If you were a senator, and I'm giving you a promotion here, Gene, would you vote to confirm Mr. Barr or would you say no, the memo in of itself is too big a question mark? I'll give you my answer after you tell you, I'll tell you how close I am to the bar people. I trained his daughter. When I was in Eastern District, Virginia, I trained his daughter. I had high regard for him when he was attorney general and deputy attorney general back in 89 and 93. But given that he's written this memo in June of 2018 and basically said that the Mueller investigation is baloney, is baloney, and that he wants to essentially cut it off at the knees, he should recuse himself for one reason. When I got hired by the Justice Department, I was told, forget actual conflicts, forget apparent conflicts. You should be, quote, purer than Caesar's wife. I'll never forget that quote when I first got hired. And Mr. Barr should be purer than Caesar's wife if he is nominated, if he's confirmed, and I would vote against it. If he is confirmed, he should recuse himself. It looks horrible. It's a cloud. And he should stay out of it. We're going to find out soon enough. Gene, as always, I appreciate the time. We even worked Caesar into the answer. That was pretty impressive. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, everybody. When we come back, a uh, few states in our viewing area uh, had some chief executives tell them how good things are going to be. Uh, well, we'll give you some grades on them. The governors of New York and New Jersey each deliver their state of the state addresses. We'll show you what they said and also talk about the challenges each of the states are facing in the year ahead.